Welcome to Coast View, the show that every single day celebrates the men and women who are making Coastal Mississippi such a great place to live, work, and play. Hey, listen, no big speeches today. I want to go to my friend Julian Rankin, and uh, I would refer to the Walter Anderson Museum as maybe recession-proof, but I don't want to go that far. But we're, you know, it's in the middle of Ocean Springs. Ocean Springs is thriving. The Walter Anderson story is so darn compelling. People who come to Ocean Springs want to connect to his legacy. And the uh, Walter Anderson Museum of Art in, in Ocean Springs does a great job of that. Not only do they do a great job of telling that story, but they do an incredible job of outreach because of a really active board and a terrific executive director in Julian Rankin. So I always enjoy spending time with him. But am I am I stretching it when I say you might be a little bit recession proof? Probably so, but I think it, it is important to, and I, and I love being candid with the community about how nonprofits work. You know, it's it's, a, it's important to know how we fit into the larger economic and business climate. Um, you know, resilience is baked into the story. So in that sense, you know, we're used to, and we all are, I think, here in coastal Mississippi, you know, used to challenges and weathering storms, physical and, and uh, philosophical, thematic, otherwise. But um, you know, it's been really interesting and being in Ocean Springs does help. You know, we have so many tourists and, you know, traffic from around the region and the country and the world that comes here and they want to get a taste of what the, the culture is about. And so that's what we represent. But, you know, it, it's been very interesting, um, certainly recently, even with, you know, we have a capital project that we're preparing to, uh, to break ground again on the next phase of. And we talk about material costs and there's all these things that we're all dealing with across the board. So while we do have, you know, wonderful support, a great product, um, you know, and, and we're confident in our abilities to continue to, to be here and, you know, we're never going away and it, it's, it's a challenge and that, but that's part of the story. And so that, in that sense, it's, it's completely appropriate that, you know, we, uh, we attack this challenge just like any other. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. <clears throat> I said to Kurt Allen from, you know, he's the president and CEO of the Mississippi Aquarium. He was on recently. I said to him that um, while their numbers may be down right now, he doesn't know what normal is because they opened up during the pandemic. Then they had hurricanes. And thank God Mississippi stayed open to, you know, really help them have a robust, for the most part, uh, first full year of operation. But they're experiencing some down numbers now. Uh, we're at the beginning of the summer. We don't have a good feel for what the recalibration of people's travel plans are going to be. Most most studies suggest that people still plan to travel. However, they're making modifications in their plans. I think, though, just as it was a, a competitive advantage for coastal Mississippi during the pandemic that people drove here in their cars, 80% of the people who travel here come here in their cars, that they feel safe in their cars, that we were a good destination for them because we understood what it meant to, to give them a safe you know, place to go visit. In the same way that we have sort of a competitive advantage around that, I think we also may have a competitive advantage during these high grass, gas price moments. So people may choose to stay here and do a staycation or people from, you know, the, the ring that they that they draw across three or four states, you know, they may choose to come here because we are a low cost va a vacation with gaming and a beach and all the things that come with that. What, what's your take on that? What do you think if, you know, a year or two down the road, we look back on this. Will coast of Mississippi have been in a good place in spite of inflation and, and all the other economic threats to have taken advantage of the moment? And will our numbers show that? I mean, I, I think they will. I mean, I think, like you say, you know, from the get go, when many places in the country were dealing with, you know, being completely shut down, completely closed, you know, we were able to uh, to still be responsible, but to, to give people an experience that they um, they were missing. And I think those are turning you know, folks who didn't know about coastal Mississippi, the secret coast, you know, into fans of it. And so um, the same is true now. And, you know, we have the, the benefit of being a little bit um, a, a world apart from Mississippi. You know, the, the coast, we think about our relationship to other states. I mean, people, I, I grew up as a child in North Mississippi and, you know, they folks up there don't often get to the coast. So it, it, it is, even though it's within driving distance, it's a bit exotic, even for people within the state. I think that's a good thing because we um, we do have such diversity across our coast east to west experiences and places to go and the weather and all the rest and so i think in in any way you slice it we have that um that use as you say competitive advantage and i think for the museum you know to talk about you know what what we've seen um it's about being 
relevant to the community. So we, you know, we do a lot of work when there's an opportunity, a need, that's, that's a place where us as a nonprofit can fit in, you know, whether that's <laughs> workforce development or economic development in Pascagoula, I've talked about the projects we do over there with public art, um, you know, all down the line. And, and so there is a lot of, you know, Gulf Coast Restoration Fund money development happening. Um, so even as, you know, things are, are rising, costs are rising, it's a, it's a double-edged sword and a pendulum. Um, it illuminates the strength that we have right here. For example, in Ocean Springs, inventory on housing is completely, you know, uh, non-existent. Well, that's not good, and for some people, obviously, to try to break in, but it shows that there's strength in that market. And so, in, in some ways, you know, I think it, it, just as you were talking about the museum from the top, um, you know, we're not as a region recession-proof. No one is, but we do have such diversity. The portfolio of our experiences, our businesses. And our people are, are smart and, and have that ingenuity that I think we're in a really interesting and, and good position relative to a lot of places across the country. Yeah, I'll love it. it it'll, be, it'll be anecdotal. At some point, we'll have the opportunity to really look at it statistically, but it'll be anecdotal for now. But uh, whereas the, the aquarium said, when you compare their current experience to what they were experiencing last year during their first year of opening, they would expect to be down some. They have to decide, you know, how much of that is relative to re, to opening, and how much of that is relative to uh, the inflationary pressures and gas prices and all the things that are affecting them. We'll have a better, clearer picture of that in the months ahead. But but uh, but so their business is down year to date. What are you experiencing year to date? So we're we've seen an increase certainly. I mean, we have been so busy this spring. There's in some ways a lot of tour groups from the local schools. You know, we didn't get to see a lot of students the past couple of years because of of COVID. And so a lot of students coming in, both from you know Ocean Springs, which you would expect, but really all over the region. So that's been wonderful. And the traffic and the tourist traffic has really picked up. So we had good traffic last year, but um, just this year, you know, we operate on a January to December fiscal year, but this first quarter, um, you know, we're up about 30% in terms of just attendance through the door. Um, the other interesting thing is, you know, we have in the past two years um, increased our budget and our staffing um, at a rate that we hadn't um, since I've been here almost four years now. And so it, it was, again, part of the fact that we've been able to get funded new projects. We, we need more staff. We're expanding our campus. So it's a little bit of a different scenario. Um, but it's it's a it's a really a, 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 a function of the coinciding state money, both through, you know, e economic development grants that we've gotten, stimulus, of course, and, and COVID money, but also private foundations, community members. You know, we've been able to do a lot of things with municipalities and other organizations that are exciting to people. And so we have a lot of momentum. And I think the momentum really has come from, as I mentioned, these opportunities, the, the challenges of a, of a new landscape. And back to the Walter Anderson legacy, that's exactly where we tend to thrive. It's, uh, it's so exciting. I, I love the way you say it, and I think you're right. I mean, the the fact is that um, coast of Mississippi has a growing number of uh, places to visit, things to do, very diverse. So, you know, while one might be down, the other might be up, and vice versa. It's just you know, but but as a as a as an entity, as a as a coast of Mississippi entity. I do believe, I do believe, and I think you're saying this too, that when you compare our market to other markets like ours in six months, a year down the road, just like we did during the pandemic, you know, leading the recovery from Mississippi, we will have sort of weathered the storm better than most. And but and come on, man, let's face it. I mean, the, the price of gas really shows no signs of letting up. And uh, we're looking at record numbers. The impact that has on the average family it's substantive. It, there's, it, it, they're not in a position where they can say, well, let's just go ahead and do that. It doesn't work that way. They have bills to pay. They have, you know, they got to make ends meet. So they're having to make adjustments. And as they make those adjustments, to what extent will Coastal Mississippi be on the uh, receiving end of maybe some decisions that, you know, to come here that they maybe they weren't going to make initially because they were going to take a, a plane somewhere. Maybe they're going to make a long drive to Yellowstone or whatever it was they were going to do. I think that we might again be in that position. I hope I hope that's where we are. Any comment about that before I shift gears? Just to say that, you know, A, you know, we're as rosy of a picture as I painted, it is a challenge and it's uncertain and it's scary to be in an economic environment like this. But to your point about local people, you know, we 
tactically, you know, even on June 9th is our next quarterly, you know, street festival that's free to the public and free admission and people who decide to go out to Horn Island, whether that's a, on a camping trip with the museum or on their own boat or with a friend, you know, Walter Anderson would again point back to the importance of the local uh, place and the environment and how there's much to discover in our own backyards. It's a great opportunity to do that. So that's that's exciting. We're, we're visiting with my friend Julian Rankin, who is the executive uh, director for the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. Uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to shift gears slightly and talk a little bit more about this growing opportunity in coastal Mississippi to attract people from all over this country to move here because we're an affordable place to live and how that attaches to some of the outreaching efforts that the museum is involved in. We'll see you after this break. Welcome back to Coast. You have my friend Julian Rankin, Executive Director for the Walter Anderson Museum of Art and a good friend, somebody I deeply admired as a, as a leader, kind of a visionary. He's got he's the wordsmith. He has a, a way with words. And he does such a great job of describing the relationship art has to our lives, the, 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 the landscapes and, and how that defines us. And people like Walter Anderson, who was just literally, who was a literal Renaissance man who traveled the world, the impact that he had on coastal Mississippi and the opportunity to Walter Anderson Museum, not just with Walter Anderson, but other artists like him, maybe not exactly like him, but to be able to uh, to bring their 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 work to the forefront so people can learn from it and understand it and have a greater appreciation for the community. And that's what all museums do, though, buddy. All museums are supposed to do that. But what what's cool about what you guys are doing is you're now you're you've gone way beyond just having this physical location that attracts students and people and visitors to there to appreciate Walter Anderson, but you're you're trying to play a role in sort of the greater the greater community uh, mission, which is um, to always raise the bar, to to never be complacent, to focus on how we can be better at everything, and making sure art has a role in that, of course. But to attract people from all over the country to come here, I said at the you know when we went to break that there's this growing conversation within the business council. I had a great conversation with Brandon Elliott from Elliott Homes, who's involved in this through the Business Council, they're, they're developing some audacious goals of attracting people for the next several years because this is an affordable place to live. Everybody's going through that conversation right now all across the United States. Coastal Mississippi is well positioned to take advantage of this opportunity. I mean, this is real, isn't it, isn't it, Julian? It is, and there's, like you said, there's energy in every little pocket of, of, of the coast. And, you know, we've done a lot of work and are continuing to really think about how community development can, can be one of the tips of the spear of, of how we think about, you know, our relationship to partners and, you know, the public sector, you know, municipalities and cities. Um, you know, we have several projects that, you know, if you come to the museum, you'll see in action and, and other cities, too, that we've been a part of. And I mean, this is these are partnerships with the you know, with English shipbuilding, with um, again, with mayors and, and city councils and aldermen and other nonprofits, um, some of whom are about public safety or who are about workforce training. And I think the quality of life piece and what does culture really mean? You know, that's where the museum, I hope, is is really um, amplifying a message that's far beyond our, our nexus here in Ocean Springs, because I think when people come, whether they're here for several years as, you know, military um, posting or they're coming because they're um, coming from California or some other place to be an executive in some in, in industry that is, you know, whether that's banking or, again, in Pascagoula and, and Ingalls and Chevron and Mississippi Power, you know, what makes them stay and what makes people want to come down and kind of peek in because there's a rumbling down down south about some interesting things happening. And that storytelling piece, just like you're doing, is something that we are naturally equipped to do. I think it really comes, the strength of that comes from the relationship between entities, um, because whether it's a single individual artist who's doing something interesting that we can connect with someone else who has a need for that, or whether it's a large scale public artwork and trail, you know, that interfaces with, you know, a revitalization. Yeah, I think that's what we want to do is think about development, community development, cultural development, um, much more than just what we do in preservation of the, of the Anderson artwork. I've mentioned this to you before. My son Jordan Matthews is a um, lawyer with uh, Schwartz and Orgler, and they do banking, real estate, and court of, of course general law. And 
Jordan made the point to me that you know, they've seen just a large number of, of closings from people outside this area. Just a lot of folks are trans. I mean, that's that's always driven us since some of our real estate. But there's a lot of people who are buying uh, houses here in coastal Mississippi, relocating here. I mean, that's a just one little sign and signal of what's happening. And he th- he believes that that will continue to drive. Uh, a lot of the real estate market, the number of people who are coming in here. And um, uh, uh, certainly that happened a lot during the pandemic. But uh, but it's it's in order for us to reach our goals, I, I keep coming back to this comment that, that um, John Harrison at Hancock Whitney said. He said, since the early 1990s, we've not had a game-changing economic thing happen, you know, since the casinos came here. And what is going to be that next thing? It's not going to be probably not going to be a single industry. It's not going to be a relocation of a major employer, most likely. It's probably going to be something like what we're talking about now, where we're taking advantage of this being an affordable, the most affordable beach community to live in in the United States, taking advantage of that and attracting people to move here and the accumulation of them, you know, professionals and technology people and, you know, all these people who are part of the creative class uh, taking advantage of that and and having a real boom for for, for Mississippi. We're, there, there's What I'm trying to say is there's no lull in the action, even though we are, we're dealing with all these economic challenges. There's no lull in the action. It, it, in fact, it's pushing people because of the high cost of living in these other areas to reconsider what is it they're going to do? And how does Coastal Mississippi take advantage of that? I'm sure you're hearing this in many of the conversations that you're involved with as it relates to community building. And it's a real opportunity, isn't it? It is. And I mean, I think when I th- hear you talk about that, when I think about what people from outside of the region see here um, and, and what draws them here, whether they're just visiting or staying, it's it's the homegrown energy that is defining the place. So, you know, we talk about Ocean Springs a lot, but just to kind of take that off the board, I mean, there's a lot obviously happening here, but look at Biloxi, Pascagoula, you know, way, I know people in Waveland who are doing interesting things, obviously the Pass and, and Bay St. Louis. You can pick any of these, and those are just the ones on the water. You know, you go north as well. People are finding opportunities, small business owners, folks who have an idea to put that into action. And I think the places where saturation has not yet, you know, hit that critical mass, um, not that it has anywhere, but, you know, places that are, in a renaissance of their own, that's where really where the exciting thing happens because it's a long, you know, it's a long game. And so I think the more people who are having their own ideas and expanding, scaling them, you look at in, in Biloxi, for example, on Howard Avenue. There's big things happening, but there's also the you know the greenhouse um, a coffee shop who had a place in Ocean Springs. They opened another one in Biloxi. They're growing. You have artists who are doing interesting things. There's a studio in Waveland that too. Um, artists run um, the gallery and they produce work there and it's helping to give a definition to that downtown environment and experience. And that's where the, I think the exciting things happen because people who come from outside of the region, they don't just want the packaged final product. They do want to see that there's energy coming up behind. And that's where we will have nodes of uh, development that are far beyond what people think of as the three, four, five, six places that they know to go in coastal Mississippi, and they'll find that there's really dozens more as people continue to take risks here locally and put their ideas into action. Um, And without that, you know, we just end up, um, we could end up, any community can end up just like any other one. You don't want just people from outside, you know, coming here and and arriving here and, and losing that local flavor. And so we're fortunate to have enough of that energy where there's a lot coming up behind uh, the already established places. And that's exciting. People want to feel the vibe. I don't want to compare us to New York City. My son lives in New York City, and he lives in the West Village. And it's it's comparable in this way in that his friend groups do things together, and they walk where they go most of the time. And they they want a wide variety of things to do. But, you know, they have dinner together. They'll have drinks together. They'll go to, to, to plays together. They'll do just a wide variety. Of, they go to church together. They do all these things. It's just a wide variety of things. That That is what, when Andreas Duany and, and, and his group developed the new urbanism approach, that people won't live out in rural areas. They'll want to live in downtown. They'll want to live, work, and play in a very similar area. 
It's taken a, a bit of time for that to really catch on in Coast Mississippi, but it's caught on now. And what we're seeing, you mentioned downtown Biloxi, you're seeing one after another of mixed use, um, you know, developments happening. Gulfport's going to do one that's going to be tens of millions of dollars on, at the at the corner of Highway 90 and 49. In fact, that's Stuart Speed going to be on the show soon that we're going to talk about that, but. It's uh, now we're starting to start to talk about density. You know, it's not just people buying homes downtown because there aren't many homes left. Now we're now we're talking about mixed use where there might be a restaurant below and some some living above, but uh, you know more density. And and with that density comes a vibe, comes people and more th- and then more things to do. Businesses tend to go where people are. It kind of is a it's a it's a it's, it just will continue to sort of evolve, don't you think? Yeah, and I mean, Gulfport is a great example because that, you know, if you think about our kind of uh, what's our metropolitan area, I mean, Gulfport is the place where you have the, reminds me a little bit of like Charlotte or something, you know, it's the it's the banking center, it's it's where there are high rises. And and then you think of a business like Chandelier Brewing, you know, Chandelier Island Brewing Company who's been there since, you know, for so many years now, and, and they're doing really innovative events and festivals in addition to just putting out really good craft beer product and not to mention many of those products they do are in collaboration with the aquarium or with the Walter Anderson Museum. They have this cultural mindset. So I think it is about, you know, it's density of actual development, but it's also density of of creative people who are understanding that they fill a certain role um, just as the, the bankers and the financers and the industry folks do. And the awareness of where we all fit is really the, the magic that I think um, unlocks the potential because it's easy to get in our own silos and not even go down the road, even though we're, we're so knit together as a coastal region. Um, but that's where we want to continue to branch out, um, both myself personally, even beyond the museum, and try to be a voice for just thinking outside the box, just taking a little bit of time to look around you, see where the synergy is and, and work together. This show's all about learning, man. I hope, we hope people who pay attention are as excited about the future as we are. Uh, we have the opportunity. This has been Julian Rankin from the Walter Anderson Museum. Have a great day.